Hello, good people. I'm very happy to be back with you. I want to use this video to tie up a few loose ends that are in my head from some conversations that have been going on in this corner of the internet. Still being distracted by John Verveke, of course. <laughs> and um, I'm still processing some of what he said in his great conversation with Andrew Sweeney and also his three-way conversation with Guy Sangstock and Johannes Niederhauser, I hope I said that correctly, and also his talk at Lakeland University and the um, question and answer after it, that was quite interesting. Okay, so when he was doing his talk at Lakeland University during the question and answer, someone asked him about what he has been saying about the flow state. So let me just review real quick what he had said. He talks about the flow state as being that condition that we get into when we're in an activity where we're operating kind of at the very edge of our ability, constantly being challenged, and um, it creates what he calls an insight cascade where we have to keep making adjustments to what's going on and that this is training our uh, our mental machinery it's training our cognitive machinery to become more insightful and of course there is a connection between wisdom and insight so getting into the flow state seems to be good for training this cognitive machinery. And on top of that, as John Verveke has said, people who get into the flow state on a regular basis seem to have more of a sense that their life has meaning, okay? Now, two of the examples that John Verveke has used regarding getting into the flow state are rock climbing, and playing video games. So somebody asked him the question what, of whether they were equally good at, um, at transferring into wisdom. In other words, getting into the flow state and rock climbing, getting into the flow state in a video game, was there any difference in whether that flow state translated outside of that activity? John Verveke thought that was a very good question. He said so, and he then said that yes, there is a difference. That the flow state that people get into when playing video games did not seem to translate. In other words, it didn't seem to train their cognitive machinery in any areas other than in the video game. But that rock climbing, that kind of flow state did. And, um, so he said that the difference between them had to do with what you were interacting with. So when you're interacting with a video game, something that's not real. And if you're interacting with the rock climbing, you're interacting with the rocks. The way John Verveke put it was he said, you're interacting with the causal structures of the world. And so it was transferable to other domains. Now, I would have maybe phrased this a little bit differently. Maybe I would have said you're interacting directly with the structure of the earth. I don't know if I would call rocks the causal, <coughs> causal structure of the world, but the fact that it's real and hard and part of, um, part of the earth is certainly an important point. I have a bit of a sore throat, so I'm hoping that my voice holds out through this video. Okay, now, this business of um, rock climbing and the kind of activity it is and what you're interacting with reminds me of something that Eric Weinstein recently talked about on one of his um, The Portal podcasts with one of his guests and he talked about the need for people to engage with things that are unforgiving okay and he mentioned rock climbing as one of the instances of us engaging with something that's unforgiving 
He also mentioned the fist of your opponent if you're in a boxing ring and mathematics as that unforgiving thing when it comes to the mental realm, okay? Um, I thought of something that I would consider to be an unforgiving thing that's very primal and part of um, our experience as beings on this earth. And that is, as a woman, I have given birth and unmedicated, I have had several unmedicated births and I think that labor is pretty unforgiving. And one of the things I would observe about myself is that after I had, I had one of my children at home with a midwife. And after that, I would think to myself when I had to do something hard, I would think, okay, I had a baby at home with no medication. I can do this thing. It became a touchstone for me. So think about how that relates to rock climbing. I mean, we use this word. We talk about something being a touchstone. We don't ever call it a touch fluffy. <laughs> okay, so that's that unforgiving nature of something. Now, I wanted to spend a few minutes kind of then exploring this question of activities that might train our cognitive machinery. Now, of course, the flow state can be gotten into with a lot of activities. Um, some other things that John Berbeke has mentioned is jazz. Um, there's other kinds of performance, music, performance, um, dance, certainly different kinds of sports. Um, then there's other kinds of activities that are not as, um, maybe don't seem quite as big in terms of what they are, like you're not performing for someone or um, you're not um, climbing rocks or some sort of elaborate activity like that. I have told people for years that I got into an altered state of consciousness whenever I sat down at my sewing machine. So I think things like sewing, I had the same experience as a potter's wheel, working on a potter's wheel. I think it's the kind of thing that uh, people who work on a lathe, woodworking, would experience probably other kinds of um, artisan, artisan um, activities such as spinning, weaving, carving, painting, welding, blacksmithing, glass blowing. Now, one thing that's interesting about all of these activities is not only that they get you into the flow state, but also that you're producing something. And of course, when you're performing, you're doing music or or um, dance or something like that, you are producing something too. You're producing a performance, something that people can see and enjoy. Um, and I think that in addition to the fact that you get into the flow state, that part of what makes these activities meaningful is that they are productive. So you have productive satisfaction. You can look at something that you've made. And I think that um, that's, that's probably part of what makes these activities people feel that these activities are meaningful and feel that their lives have meaning when they're engaged in them. But there's a whole nother set of activities that I think probably contribute to meaning in life, but that do not get you into the flow state. Instead, I would call them contemplative activities. Um, kind of this sort of thing that um, the Benedictines say, like ora et labora, pray and work. So it's the idea that there's activities that you can do that you're working and you're praying and you really can do them together. You can do both the praying and the working together. Okay, so these are activities where you're not so focused. The thing about the flow state is you have to be very, very concentrated on what you're doing. But the contemplative activities are different. They are activities you can engage in with like part of your brain paying attention and part of it free for thinking. So what are some of these activities? Well, some of the ones that came to my mind were things like grinding wheat, kneading bread, some different kinds of cooking, weeding, planting, digging, pitching hay or mulch, um, caring for animals, a lot of housework, a lot of kinds of cleaning, vacuuming, dishwashing, driving, a lot of times people um, will talk about how their mind just sort of wanders off while they're driving to the point where they don't even really remember the actual drive and think, 
what was I even really paying attention while I was driving in? Yeah, they were, but they just got so lost in thought that the driving was automatic and their th their thinking or contemplation just took took over. One con contemplative activity that I think is um, is very wonderful is nursing a baby. <laughs> nursing a baby is a very contemplative. It makes me very sad to see a woman um, nursing a baby. Uh, and holding a phone in her hand and looking at the phone while she's nursing the baby when she's got that but um the eyes of that baby to look into and that baby is so hungry to look into the eyes of its mother too hunting and fishing can be um contemplative they can be either they can be the kind of hunting and fishing that gets you into the flow state if the depending on the kind of hunting or fishing they are um or they can be very contemplative, like um, a hunter who's spending a number of hours in a deer stand waiting for deer to come has much time to be contemplative. Many of these activities, of course, are very productive. And so they have that same kind of productive satisfaction um, connected to them. And there are also many of them connected to the earth. Um, speaking of productive satisfaction, Joe Rogan recently had someone on his um, on his podcast and was talking. They were talking together about being hunters and uh, hunting things like bears and uh, large animals, elk, moose, things like that. And they talked about the the wonderful sense of being a provider, of being able to bring that meat back home and share it with their family or give it away to friends. And then what a joy it was to have their friends cook the meat up and then send them pictures of it on the grill or something. And that sense of being a provider. And um, Joe Rogan's guest said that it, um, he felt like it lit up his genetics or turned on his genetics to do this. It's like, such a primal thing that it's like it gets you in touch with your um your ancestors in a way um it just make makes you feel so connected to all of humanity that that has come before you and um and i have experienced that too just like with planting with planting plants having that sense of connection that i'm doing something that has been done for just you know, all of these past ages of mankind and a sense of solidarity with all of the women who've been working in gardens for, you know, all of their life. The same thing with kneading bread. I feel like kneading bread turns on my genetics being an activity that women have engaged in for just so many generations. So I guess one of my questions is, what is the connection to the meaning crisis that people are no longer doing these kinds of things that they're not doing these kind of productive things they're not they're not having the opportunity to really contemplate um they're not having the sense of satisfaction of producing things um just something to think about now this brings up another angle that um was mentioned by Jonathan Verveke or John Verveke, which is that meaning is not as connected to purpose as to mattering. Okay, so um, what he said was that what people really are longing for in order to have a sense of meaning is not just that they have a purpose in life and people say, well, you have to have a purpose, you have to have a goal. He says people don't find their meaning there the way they find their meaning is by mattering. That is being connected to something larger. Okay, now the idea of mattering goes in two directions, right? So you have what matters to you and also what you matter to. So it's reciprocal. Um, the more you matter, <laughs> the more things matter to you. And the more things matter to you, the more you matter. Okay, so let me go back to the hunter example and Joe Rogan was talking about. Okay, so if you're a hunter, you matter to your community or to your family because of you're bringing in food, right? And then the more you matter to the community, the more your hunting matters to you. 
if nothing matters to you, then you don't matter, right? And if you don't matter, then nothing matters to you. So it's a very reciprocal relationship. The more you matter, the more things matter to you and vice versa. Now this is, you know, this is um, an interesting thing to think about when we consider that they did a survey a while back and something like 30 to 40% of workers say that their jobs are meaningless, that they're not really, they're not really serving any kind of purpose at all in their job. It's just like a busy work thing or a make work thing. And doesn't really, it's not, it doesn't really matter what they, if they were to disappear from their job tomorrow, nobody would miss what they do. It doesn't matter. And they know that they don't matter to the corporation they work for. A lot of times people don't want to get into big corporations or or if they're going to school, they don't want to go to a big college or big university because then they feel like they don't matter. They're just a number. So this reciprocal mattering, this idea of having things matter to you because you matter really points to something, I think. I think it points to something important that has to do with the place of man in the universe. It points to the role of man in the cosmos. It points to man's role as a priest. Okay, now the role of a priest is to mediate between higher and lower levels of being. A priest brings the blessings, gathers the blessings from above and brings them down and distributes them below. And he gathers what is below and offers it to what is above, okay? He joins the levels of being. It's, it's like, it's opponent processing, right? It's like emergence and emanation with the man in the middle mediating between the two. Priesthood is one of the three offices of Christ, who is priest, prophet, and king. And this is the model of man, and it shows us man's place in the cosmos. These offices belonged to Adam, and they belonged to man generically, but history is a record of how human beings have perverted those offices. Instead of bringing the blessing of God down upon creation and gathering creation to praise God, man engaged in human sacrifice, founding his civilization on blood as Cain did, and that's a very well elaborated by Rene Girard. Instead of the dominion or kingship exercised in loving stewardship, instead we've had tyranny, um, oppression, slavery. Instead of speaking the word of God, the oracles of God, we have lies, manipulation, false testimony, demagoguery, the thumb on the scale in commerce and in law. But Christ purifies these offices by uniting the opposites. He is priest and also victim. He's king and also servant. He's the prophet and in fact the logos, the word of God, but he's also the unspeaking infant and the silent lamb. Flannery O'Connor said, reality is the incarnation. Through Christ, man is restored to his position as a priest, and he's also shown how his priesthood, combined with his kingship and prophetic role, can be exercised in full dignity and in healing power. So this brings me to the final point, and that has to do with the conversation I had before with John Verbeke about worship. So when we were talking about worship, I had elaborated about worship in um, kind of like in terms that uh, Thomistic terms, right? I had talked about that it was the virtue of justice in relation to God is religion is worship. And, um, and John kind of responded that he didn't see how the one or the ground of being would need anything from him. You know, it's like, God doesn't need anything from us. It's kind of seems odd, right? 
So I could see this kind of this Thomistic formulation about justice in the soul in regarding to with worship uh, didn't really resonate with him. To him, and I've heard other people say this, it makes God sound kind of petty, like what we're doing in worship is uh, stoking, stroke, stroking God's ego, you know, <laughs> telling him how great he is so that we make him, we make him feel better. And I mean, I don't think that kind of misapprehension of that point is John's fault, um, it, it, nor is it the fault of, you know, someone else who says that's, how, that's what it seems like what we're doing in worship, because it's, it's our responsibility to express this thing in a way that people can, um, can comprehend it. So I, so I think that this business about the mattering and, ma and, having things matter to you gives a better um, picture of it, right? Because we have lost the sense, humans have lost the sense or men have lost the sense that we participate in, cos in the cosmic order and what our place is, right? So it might connect better to the phenomenological experience of this dual aspect of mattering to understand that this is what worship is. It is that being in the center. It is that be, being in the center between the greater and what is below it is bringing the blessings. It is bringing the food from the hunt and bringing it and, and then distributing it to the community. Um, it is that connection between the different levels of reality. So what we do, and many of these activities are activities that also get us into a flow state or they are um, contemplative. Well, what we do is we gather the elements, we're bringing them to order, and then we elevate them by offering them to the higher level. This might be our community. It might be something like, it can be an ideal like progress or um, the progress of an art or of a science or offering them to God. This is the essence of what uh, the status of man as priest is. And then we bring down the blessing, right? We bring down the blessing. So the blessing of, um, of the community then goes out into the um, into the wider world, the blessing or the blessing of God goes into the wider world. So to, here's an illustration. So going back with the hunting. So the hunters, what do they do? Well, they buy a license to hunt, right? And the hunting licenses, the, the fees for the hunting licenses are used for conservation. So that's bringing that blessing of the higher level into the lower. All right, and you can think of many um, things that are like that. Jonathan Peugeot would probably be able to rattle off a bunch of examples. All right, so this is worship, is what human beings do, and um, it is the cosmic role of man in the cosmos, <laughs> I think, anyway. And I think that that kind of um, ties together a number of things that have been going on in this corner of the internet and some other stuff that I saw on YouTube. And um, so you can tell me what you think about that. And until we are together again, treat yourself as though you are someone you are responsible for helping because you are responsible. So am I, and together we are making the world. Bye for now. Thanks so much for watching.